The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Thank you. The gospel of salvation according to John. Glory, Glory to, to you, you o Lord. Lord. There was a wedding at Cana in the Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told them, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it. And when the head waiter had tasted the water that had become wine without knowing where it came from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves good wine first. And then when people have drunk freely, an inferior one. But you've kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs at Cana in the Galilee, and so revealed his glory. And his disciples began to believe in him. Friends, the lovely gospel of the Lord. Pe evangelica dicta deleantro nostra delicta. Lord God Almighty, I ask you, may we be benefited by the Holy Spirit so that as you have said that the Spirit does different works for service, for the benefit of others, for the building up of the good, the common good. So may now we receive your Spirit for the benefit of believing, of believing and living. To God be glory, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think you know that, I think this is true of Father O'Driscoll too, I, lots of times I spend the week kind of listening, so I do the work and prepare for the talk, but what are you saying, Jesus? So I was blessed during the week from the breviary with a text from Ephesians, so I'd like to give a sermon rather than a homily, but I will get to the, the famous miracle of Cana at the end. A long time ago when I was in Reading, one of the collaborators, a layman who was a staff member and a very effective one, told me my definition as a priest. I'm sure you'd want to know. He said, Jim, your job is to speak encouragingly. I never forgot it. It is my job. It's also yours. <laughs> St. Paul in Ephesians offers good advice about how we use speech. And I've gone to different translations for this little piece of material in chapter 4 from verses 29 to 32. First thing he says is, never let evil talk pass your lips. The subject is foul language directed at somebody. We're very familiar with it, aren't we? It's speech that abuses. One of the translators told me by reading it, it's rotten. It's disgusting. It's foul. 
And Paul says this. Uh, it's one of my favorite lines. I've often run into it and found that, gee, what a great piece of advice. Only say the good things people need to hear. Only say the good things people need to hear. Paul is telling us that all people, all the folks in our lives, need edification. You heard that. We are to build up each other. That's one of the definitions of marriage, by the way. Permanent lifelong union of equals who have made a decision to lay down their lives for one another in order to build up each other into the image of Christ, huh? So that edification, that building up of each other, what a terrific idea. Another idea, for the same way of translating, to give grace to those who hear us. Wow. To grace a person, to bless somebody by the way we speak. Wow. Speak to be a benefit to those who hear you is another way of saying the same thing. Say the things that will really help people. Oh, wow. So my friend back a thousand years ago was right. My job is to speak encouragingly. And how often you have done that toward me. I can look at some of you here who have done that in my life. In our families, in your marriages, with the people we disagree with, with the folks that we meet who are upset with us or with other things, there's a chance encounter with that human being to build that person up. There is the opposite, and it's in the same little piece from Ephesians. I just found out, checking with the commentators, that the Hebrews thought that this kind of bad language or talk towards people saddened God. Never, I remember seeing it many times, but that my abusive speech of you affects God. Wow. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you have been sealed. So that's baptism and confirmation. What a thought. I can make God sad. I've always thought that, haven't you, about Jesus? I mean, he is the best friend we all have. And then I let him down. Wow. How often, I don't know about you, many times I say to him, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a dope with a capital D. What's the matter with me? So we need to hear that we can hurt God by the way we speak, just as we hurt others by the way we speak. St. James says, the tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. He's usually pretty direct, James is, like another one you know who's James, right? I thought that was funny, Hickey. Okay, all right. He says, with the tongue we bless the Lord God, the Father, and with the tongue we curse human beings who are made in the likeness of God. And then he says, that need not be so. Paul bluntly teaches Get rid of all bitterness, passion, anger, harsh words, slander, and malice of every kind. It's quite a list. So God is saying in the same text, by the way, in Ephesians, that lovely word in English, be kind. It's fun being a priest. It's fun learning how to be a Christian. It's fun to learn that I can do that. I can be kind. So can you. Be compassionate. I've said to you many times, my blessed brother Danny Hickey, because he was retarded, because as a kid I'd stand up for him again and again, I learned compassion. Forgive one another, says Paul, just as God has forgiven you in Christ. And in the Psalter, in Psalm 23, 34, Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit and guile. 
Turn from evil, do good, seek peace, and follow after it. Now let's look at our Blessed Mother. You know, saying something that boosts somebody or helps them out or gives an insight is really what happened today in the Gospel, right? But if you notice, there's a subtlety about Mary. Unlike a lot of us, she doesn't tell him what to do. She tells him what she sees. Don't you do that? I do that. I think of some of you I've had on my list for prayer. I never say to the Lord, do this or do that. I often say, Jesus, just take care of that person. So she says something very simple. Jesus, they're embarrassed. Hmm? They have no wine. And he says, it's not my time yet. She doesn't say anything. But the last and the only last thing she says in the Bible is the advice that Sean O'Malley has for his motto. You know, the Episcopal motto the bishops have? Do whatever he tells you. Boy, that's worth writing down, huh? Maybe he's saying that to you today. What is he telling you? This is your thing. What is he telling me? Today, you know, because we live in this era, we have so much media, so many different interesting ways of communicating, Facebook and all that stuff. We Catholics need to decide how we use media because it's misused. Someone say amen. amen. We can't do that, can we? This mouth of ours projected through the ethos, the era, the, the air. Our words is meant to lift people up, not put them down. We are to be like Mary. We need, like Jesus, to say only the good things people need to hear. We need to say stuff that will really help each other out. I said it already, but I wrote it down here, so I might as well read it. I wonder how often I have saddened my Lord that he looked at me and was disappointed. Oh, man. God help me. God help you. Because it not it pretty common, huh? But it doesn't have to be that way. We can decide to do better.